war. Before we go on this journey, I'm going to give you the roadmap for tonight's presentation. In the next slide, I'm going to be presenting to you my thesis question. Followed by which, we're going to discuss what is a foreign fighter. That will be followed by a non-comprehensive background on the Syrian civil war. This will include a limited list of international law violations committed by foreign fighter groups. At this point in the presentation, I want you to ask yourself, how are we holding these foreign fighters accountable for these international law violations? To answer this question, we first need to do a survey of current accountability of coaches. At this point in my research, I asked, what was the most viable option for holding foreign fighters accountable? Lastly, I'll present to you what I found and what I believe to be the most viable option. Here's my thesis question. What is the most viable option for holding, for holding foreign fighters accountable when it is determined that they violate international law during the Syrian civil war. Well, why is this important? We have domestic courts, we have international courts. How are these courts performing in bringing, bringing justice for the victims of the Syrian civil war? We'll circle back to this question throughout the presentation, but first, let's define what a foreign fighter is. Above, we see Dr. Kramer's definition for a foreign fighter. Before this definition, the definition is fairly straightforward. Someone who leaves their principal residence travels to a foreign country and then participates in armed conflict. However, this definition is fairly ambiguous because what is foreign, what is a fighter? If a Syrian refugee in 2011 is given status in France, lives there for five, six years, travels to Syria to fight for ISIS, is he considered foreign now? Well, how about what a fighter is? For all those who travel to Syria to participate in the social media campaign of ISIS, are they not a fighter because they need to operate at the combat level? These two words alone force legal discussions, let alone when they're put together. But there are still five components that scholars do agree upon for defining what a foreign fighter is. They are not overtly state-sponsored. They, overtly state -sponsored. they operate in countries that are not their own. They use insurgent tactics. They look to overthrow the power in charge. And the principal motivation is ideology, not material reward. Now that we know what now we know the gravity of defining what a foreign fighter is, let's look at a non-comprehensive background of the Syrian civil war. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to reduce the camps involved in the Syrian civil war to three. The U.S. camp, the Russian camp, and the foreign terrorist organizations. In the foreign terrorist organization, we have ISIS at 30,000 30, strong, Jabhat al nusra at 25,000 strong, and a few other thousand uh, in other al-Qaeda offshoots. By 2014, the number of foreign fighters in the Syrian civil war surpassed that of Afghanistan and doubled the number involved in the Iraq war. As we can tell on this map, by 2015, ISIS had considerable success in gaining large swaths of territory for their pseudo-state. But with the help of Russian airstrikes, Operation Harem Resolve airstrikes, ISIS was reduced to a slither of its once large pseudo-state. But in 2019, ISIS was now dissolved. There is no more Islamic State. But does this make you wonder, with 25,000 fighters jumped up to Nusra 30,000 in ISIS, where did they go? <clears throat> Out of 193 member states of the United Nations, 100 of them are home to foreign terrorist fighters who have returned. According to the United Nations, foreign fighters can be held guilty of war crimes if it is determined that, they violate, that, they, that the attacks that they perpetrated were intentionally made upon a civilian population. We know that ISIS carried out th this kind of attacks perpetually, habitually. This was part of their campaign of terror. So we know for a fact that many of the, many of the thousands of foreign fighters that returned have participated in war crimes. But is that the only crime that they committed? Above, we see a list, a limited list, of the violations committed by foreign fighter groups during the Syrian civil war. Each one very well documented by monitoring groups. I won't go through every single one of them, but I'll, give, I'll present to you a few of them. What we see in this picture is the remains of, of a memorial church to the Armenian genocide in Deir Zor. Upon ISIS's capture of this territory, they destroyed the church. This, according to the United Nations Human Rights Council, is the international, international crime of attacking protected objects. In, the next, in this next photo, we see the crucifixion of human beings. ISIS did this habitually to people of the Christian sect in Syria. This is the crime of torture and murder. This is the next photo. I blurred out the photo out of respect for the, for the young woman, but women have been, would be put on the internal server for ISIS for fighters to buy either for bribes or for sexual slavery. This is the crime of rape or sexual violence. 
Bias didn't stop there when it came to young children. In this next photo, we see children, preteens, being used to carry out execution. This is the international crime of using and recruiting children in hostilities. These are the crimes that ISIS committed and other foreign fighter groups. So how have, of course, these domestic and international courts responded to charging them with these crimes? At the International Criminal Court, they only review cases from states that are signatory to the Rome Statute. Syria is not assigned to that statute, therefore, the International Criminal Court is not the appropriate court for them to facilitate foreign fighter accountability. At the International Court of Justice, their primary responsibility is to look at conflicts and disagreements among UN member states. Thank God the Islamic State is not a member of the United Nations, so therefore, that's not the appropriate body. Well, how about domestic courts? Many countries have refused to repatriate their own citizens who they know turned ISIS fighters, obviously because they are national security risks. In the United States, a, a, a Columbia University student of Bengali origin went and fought for ISIS, was then repatriated and charged with membership with a terrorist organization. He pled guilty to two crimes, 2339B, providing material support to a terrorist organization, and 2339B, receiving military type training from a terrorist organization. In exchange for his intelligence, he was granted clemency and now walks the streets a free man. In Belgium, we have Abdel Majid Zaloumi, who was identified in the video beheading American aid worker Peter Kasich. He was sentenced to six years. In the case of Michael Delafort, who was a Belgian who went to Syria, upon his return to Belgium, he was captured and prosecuted, charged with membership with a foreign terrorist organization. He now walks the free man. When interviewed by CNN, he explicitly said that he has no remorse for, the crime, for what he did. I call him crime because he didn't work for them as a crime. But he had no remorse for what he did. Again, we see crime of membership with the terrorist organization as the principal crime in France with Nicholas and Flavian Marat. In Denmark, the same thing, crime of membership with the terrorist organization. Not the crimes, ladies and gentlemen, that we saw in the last slide. That's the summary of what I have to tell you in regards to what they're charging these, these uh, returning foreign fighters with. So at this point in my research, I pretty much declare that the current mechanisms available to hold foreign fighters accountable are inadequate, and they're wrong. So I looked in the past to see how the international community has come together to respond to gross violations of international law. Under Chapter 7 of the United Nations, the Security Council has the power and authority to establish a Security Council to restore and maintain international peace. The crimes committed by foreign fighters in the Syrian Civil War are strikingly similar to the same crimes committed in the Yugoslav Wars and the Rwandan Genocide, both of which resulted in the creation of an international tribunal to prosecute those crimes. So we can, we can conclude that when the international community determined that there was no appropriate court to prosecute the crimes committed in a specific conflict, they then proceeded forward and established an international tribunal. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most viable option we have towards holding foreign fighters accountable, establishing an international tribunal. But how do we do this? How do we establish an international tribunal? First, we're going to get a proposal. This proposal needs to aim to hold foreign fighters accountable. Most importantly, this, this proposal needs to make it through the Security Council without a veto. What this means in effect is that the shot in essence, the President of Syria, will have to go unpunished by this tribunal. This is because the current framework of international relations tells us that any proposal that's put forward that holds Bashan responsible will be met with the Russian veto, thus leaving it dead in the water. Next. We'll have to amalgamate all the reports by the monitoring groups in order so that we can tie individuals to specific crimes committed. And lastly, we need a tribunal whose benefits outweighs its costs, because this will be a very expensive tribunal. Above us, a list of some of the costs associated with this tribunal. Now, there will be criticism levied upon this tribunal. It costs a lot of money. It'll take a lot of time to investigate and actually tie individuals to the crime. And probably, most importantly, that Bashar al-Assad goes unpunished by this tribunal. But my pushback to those prisms is that if we're not willing to stand together and prosecute those that we know were part of a pseudo-state that, that religiously purged, ethnically cleansed, committed crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, need I say more, then why would there be hope for a comprehensive tribunal? If we can't stand together 
and prosecute and hold accountable those that we all agree upon, even the Syrian Arab Republic, even the Russian Federation, even Iran. We all are on the same page when it comes to ISIS and Jabhat al Nusra and Al Qaeda forces. If we're not prosecuting them for this, then by default we are quitting the foreign fighters of the international crimes I showed you before. This is why establishing a United Nations Tribunal through the United Nations Security Council is the most viable option for holding foreign fighters accountable when it is determined that they violated international law during the Syrian civil war. And last and finally, what should we call this tribunal? The International Tribunal for the Prosecution of Foreign Fighters who are responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law or international human rights law committed in the territory of the Syrian Arab Republic since 2011. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your audience.